just come in and sit down now? First, please. Please, s'il vous plaît. Yes. Yes. Welcome to the last half of the afternoon session. Um, Dr. Ricardo Colosa is here and he will be doing a presentation. I will now turn this over to him. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me here. And um, I was thinking, uh, I, I was proposed a number of themes that I had to develop for you. So I have a number of things to present. I don't really want to take too much of uh, your time. So just tell me, how much time do we have? You have um, well, between 30 to the 40 minutes. Yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll let you also decide what you want to hear today. I, I have a number of ideas that I can uh, expand to you. One is about nicotine salts. I know it's very sexy. There's a lot to talk about and why we need to talk about this. Uh, another one is, uh, is a more standard about nicotine in general, you know, what's good, what's bad, what's the value is in the nicotine, what is the story is about uh, toxicities or not. And finally, I, I have one uh, um, about the impact of vaping on human health. And also a little a niche dedicated to um, the value of animal and in vitro studies. So there's quite a lot to talk about that kept me busy. But I love it. I, I, you know, I love to be busy and I love to test myself as well. Um, I don't know. I, I would uh, like to start with the um, nicotine salt, probably because I haven't been doing this before. And I want to hear also from you that you are probably more educated than me in the area, but I try to make links to what I believe uh, it's important from a clinical point of view or subjective point of view or also from a sensorial point of view. <laughs> Before that, I, I knew very little about it. As, as you can imagine, don't spend much time uh, on blogs. But uh, in, the next, in the last couple of days, I'm spending some time on the blogs, and I discovered a whole world there. So there's a lot of interest, not just in terms of uh, um, compact pod systems uh, using uh, nicotine salts, but also, yes, yes, you're right but also uh, in a range of uh, high-powered uh, devices using also nicotine salts because um, I always thought that the reason for high salts uh, and high nicotine contents it was to um, maximizing power, having a smaller device, and achieving what is not physically achievable with uh, larger devices, with small devices. However, from a clinical and uh, individual point of view, one of the reasons why I got interested in nicotine salts is coughing. Uh, I was discussing with some of you about these calculators to make sure that the level of the nicotine is not too high in order to, to conquer the smokers on uh, his first encounter with vaping machines. So to start a uh, uh, um, a positive journey rather than a troubled one. And one of the troublemakers is coughing. 
you, you are very well aware of your initial days when you first start dating. Maybe uh, that was due to a different uh, reason, you know, high PG, for example, is one of the reasons. But uh, let's not forget that nicotine plays a very big role. And when I say nicotine, I say free base nicotine. And there's a big difference between free base nicotine and any nicotine salts. So we really need, first of all, to understand why we do cough. Okay, we do cough because it's a fantastic defensive mechanism. That's what we need in order to avoid that our organism will uh, uh, encounter foreign materials, pollutants from the environment. Okay, so we do have a very effective defensive mechanism. I always say to my patients, if they cough, that's not a bad thing. It means that they do have a good reflex. The problem with the cough is when it becomes chronic, okay? So, and it's indication of disease, so it's a different matter. But in, uh, just to simplify didactically what the cough is and why it's there, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, they respond, we do have a number of cough sensors in our body. Usually, they are located in areas where at the interface with the environment for obvious reasons. There's no point in having a cough sensors in my kneecap. <laughs> I do need cough sensors, mostly my upper airways uh, and in the in the trachea and the trachea tree. So this is where my sensors are situated. And they get stimulated by a number of stimulus. They can be sense, um, um, chemical, they can be mechanic, uh, change in temperature, um, anything. Humidity. That you, sorry? Humidity. Humidity, osmolarity, pH, do all that all this. No, I can take uh, four, four hours here. So, uh, <laughs> but the, the, the take home message is that when you do activate a cough sensor, there's an activation of a afferent limb and a response through an afferent limb. And usually their response is a, a motor response. Because when you cough, basically, you contract muscle of the cage, of the chest, right? So you have to activate these muscles to contract the cage. Usually this happens at the close gl glottis, the, cl the glottis close, and then suddenly opens, and when suddenly opens, all this high pressure that is being generated in your cage will, will, uh, will be delivered outside. So if, I feel like talking to my students today. <laughs> so as I said before, there are lots of cough sensors scattered all over the body, but mainly located in the, uh, in the upper airways. And there are hundreds of hundreds of different receptors and the taxonomy of these receptors is changing by the day. But uh, again, to cut a long story short, I think all we need to understand is there are two main groups of receptors. Those who respond to um, mechanical stimuli and those who respond to chemical and uh, stimuli. And uh, just to give a sense of what are those stimuli, uh, just to think of a foreign body, which, um, you know, you, you're having a, a nut, packet of nuts, and some nuts is going the wrong way. Instead of going to the right tube, goes to the wrong tube. You know what happens? You're coughing. And this is because the foreign body actually mechanically stimulates one of those long list of receptors I was uh, illustrating beforehand. But also heat, cold, you know, um, uh, pH, osmolarity, all these can contribute to, uh, as a stimulate to cough. In the vaping world, what can be a trigger to cough in vapors? Okay, this is a general schematic uh, illustration. It's vaping, it's vapor. You know, in vapor there are many things. Many of those things need to be fully characterized yet, okay? But uh, we do know that vaping causes coughing and this coughing is not going to last forever. 
93% of the cough tends to resolve within a couple of months, okay? And most of the coughing occurs when you first try an electronic cigarette or a vaping device, okay? So it is uh, mostly an acute situation, it's not a chronic situation, so it does not identify any disease. So I never, you will never hear of something like vaping cough disease or vaping cough syndrome, <laughs> unless you have people who are super sensitive, super sensitive to specific ingredients and they may develop specific cough to that specific ingredients. But that happens with many things in life, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. 7% uh, still coughing at 10 weeks. Is it 7% out of the 57? No, 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 it's 7% seven seven all the all ballpark. Okay. So, um, what are the main reasons for a uh, naive smoker who's uh, engaging in this new health and uh, lifestyle, in the vaping lifestyle, to cough? Well, first off is vaping technique. You know, you can modulate the uh, inflow, and because the inflow determines the mass impact of these particles, they will or will not determine stimulation of the mechano sensors. Hmm? Uh, another, another possibility is given by PG. PG, we know it's a highly irritant at high concentration, and particularly when it's uh, delivered in high amount of masses, this will contribute to quite a lot of cough. And many of you and many of the uh, retailers know how to deal with this. You know, we reduce the percentage of, uh, of PG or uh, ask people to use less uh, performant uh, uh, device in order to have less mass of, of plumes of uh, vape. Another thing is some uh, flavorings may have uh, a coughing effect. Some it's uh, actually biphasic. Menthol is actually used by, um, it's been used and still used in the tobacco industry to actually uh, reduce the, uh, the cough stimulation because it's a local anesthetic. So local anesthetics, it's like a cover, of the, it's, a, it's like a numb the cough uh, receptor. Vanillin, for example, is, a, is another agent that can uh, create problem with cough. But the reason why I wanted to talk about cough today, it was because we need to underline, underscore, that nicotine is a very frequent cause of cough, particularly nicotine strength. Obviously, all these factors need to be combined together, maybe not one in isolation. It's, it's a combination of factors. But let's Let's, in, for a minute, let's uh, imagine that it's one single factor. Let's focus on nicotine-free base. Nicotine-free base is known for having a, a level of pH which usually tends to be high, okay? And the level of pH uh, dictates the level of absorbance of nicotine. So tobacco industry knows very well how to manipulate the level of pH in order to maximize the level of absorptions of the free base. And that's the only reason why the late Philip Morris, not the company, the guy who started the company, discovered in the uh, late uh, 18th, uh, 19th century that by using ammonia, you could do the trick on the, on the tobacco smoke. So it was basically altering the pH and it was lowering the pH. By lowering the pH, you can increase absorbance of nicotine, not in the mouth, in the lung. And if you increase the nicotine absorbance in the lung, you know what happens? You bypass the liver. So immediately the nicotine goes untouched into the brain. If you instead put, you use a pipe, or you chew um, uh, a snooze, well, most of this nicotine will have a first pass metabolism, meaning that uh, at least uh, 30 to 40% of the nicotine will go away, okay? 
And uh, th obviously, there are ways of improving the cough, reducing nicotine, reducing the DGPG. If it, nothing of this works, you can just use a good pillow <laughs> and, and, uh, and you're done with it, okay? I hope this is not going to be the case, but let's go back to free base versus nicotine salt. Um, because we need to understand that the important thing in the nicotine salts is that by simply adding an acid, it can be benzoic acid, usually that's what the one that's being used, but it can be also citric acid, uh, but it, there are a number of acids, and even if, and there is a, a discussion about using different acids because there may be some limited residual risks can, can, can derive from the different use of different acids. But the bottom line here is that if I use uh, 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 an acid, I will lower the pH. So nicotine salts usually will operate a lower pH, meaning that I'm going to increase the level of absorbance of nicotine at this level and not at that level, okay? So that explains why products like Juul have PK profiles which are so very much similar to standard cigarettes. Whereas for vaping device, you really need big muscle machines to achieve that sort of uh, all level of nicotine. And sometimes, if you don't use a salt, it's very difficult to use very high level of nicotine with this very high powered machine because then the experience becomes intolerable, okay? And not just because of the cough, also because the big mass is gonna create dehydration situation in the back of your throat. And if you dehydrate the, the tissue, uh, something else is going to happen. Osmolarity will change, and this is going to be again another stimulus for, for coughing indirectly. But there are definitely other important differences between nicotine salts and free base and base nic and nicotine. For example, um, in my opinion, what really struck me it's because you have a um, fulfilling, for some people, it doesn't apply to everybody, otherwise we'd all transition to Juul and, and products like that. For some people, this is causing to have an overall positive vape experience. And from my personal uh, view, my personal view is, is that it's good. Why is that good? Because reduce the um, you know, you're, I'm quite against the, the, the principle of scaring people with this product, you know? But if you reduce nicotine in your vaping product, what happens undoubtedly is you will increase the total mass of vaping. And because there are still unknown unknowns associated with that, even though if they are negligible, if I multiply it by 10, because I increased by tenfold my level of vaping, even a negligible uh, toxicant can start becoming relevant, okay? At least from a toxicological point of view. So this is something that I think is very important in relation to nicotine salts, and that explains also why people using product like Juul do not need big Blooms to get the similar nicotine buzz, okay? Also, this means that you don't need big batteries, so you can save in terms of, uh, of compactness of the product. You just don't need high temperatures. So you can just do the trick at lower temperatures, and this means also that flowerings are better preserved, and for some people, the experience is very pleasant also because of that particular reason, not just because of less harshness, more smoother experience, also because some of the flowerings are better perceived in the back of the throat. And uh, this is just um, uh, a summary, uh, concluding slide, that uh, will tell you when 
to think of using nicotine salts. Okay, this is the case of a current smoker, but you have also cases of uh, current vapors. I, I just simplify the story by focusing on current smokers. So in current smokers, that uh, is a good thing if they want to quit cigarette and nicotine salts is good for them. They want to start vaping, but they don't know where to start, so they don't know, have friends like you, for example, who can tell all the tricks. If they want to have a good starting kit, not complex, they don't want to uh, <coughs> juggle with liquids, poor things, they don't want to experiment that much, they want an easy to use, uh, uncomplicated thing. I see this also very useful for elderly people, for example, who smoke. I can see this a very interesting application for that. Uh, actually, we use uh, nicotine salts in uh, schizophrenics, and it works beautifully, beautifully. And, and you know, I was reluctant to use complex um, vaping device because uh, schizophrenics are a bit strange. They can put in their mouth whatever they want. They can just suck it, uh, the, the, the refill bottles. So it, it was always uh, in the back of my mind to avoid uh, uh, initiating as, um, vaping studies with these products in people with mental illnesses. So, do be the trick also for that. And then, you want a vaping experience that rivals uh, with the smoking that you are deciding not to uh, indulge anymore. And, and that, that's, uh, that's good for them. So, the benefits are uh, listed here. Uh, there, there is an instant nicotine rush for the reason that I told you before, that PK is, is incredibly mimicking that of a tobacco combustible. The similar throat heat and lung field for smoking, but without the harshness. So very little coughing being induced by these products. More efficient delivery of the nicotine, of course, because you're using lower batteries, you really need to increase the level of nicotine in, in, the, in the liquid. And also because the liquid is limited, all right? Uh, that tells you quite a lot about limitation about TPD. That could be uh, counterproductive in this case. Uh, E-juices uh, are... I told you already about the perception, or a good perception about the e-juices. They are user-friendly, fits in the pocket, and um, there are options. Of course, the option is not endless, and this is probably is the biggest limitation of a closed system, not just a nicotine salt closed system, but all closed system in general. But uh, you have to live with it. And for newcomers, I don't think this is going to be a big problem because newcomers have never been exposed to the large assortments that you've been exposed to. And I think this should conclude the nicotine salt. So next one, uh, do, I would like to talk about the animals just a little bit. Do you want? Yeah. That would be quick. Quick and painful. Robert. Can I ask you a question? Oh, yeah, sure. So let's take a break. Uh, and uh, if there's any question about the nicotine salts and the cough and the. I'm okay, here. I just would like to verify. I agree with everything you said. I've been using nicotine salts for about a year in high power yeah. devices that split between 50 to 60 watts. Okay. And it is much better than. Is it's much smoother way, but like I say, I don't think it would work with TPD levels because you would need, like I started on 24 milligram nit base and 20, 20 milligram um, nit salts. I don't think it would work as well as. as yeah, that's what I was reading. Um, the lowest um, rational use of <coughs> nicotine salts would be in the range of 25 or 30. Um, Below that may be a uh, problem, but we don't have data, so it, it may be our, my feeling, your feeling, maybe just anecdotal, but uh, uh, it is good that uh, we are experiencing uh, this new era. When I show the, 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 the evolution of man and the evolution of devices, I never thought three years back 
or thinking of evolution of, of liquids. But this is exactly what we are talking about. Liquids are evolving, not just because we are differentiating in the aroma panel, but we are using different technologies to maximize aromas and nicotine delivery. Yes? Uh, regarding that, uh, that nicotine salt wouldn't work and the filter system on, or on a lower level at all on a TV level. Uh, I thought that would be a very big issue we, uh, in Sweden. Uh, these are very popular, the small closed systems among uh, uh, special um, living centers for um, schizophrenics, but also people with autism and disabilities and elderly. And they buy a lot of these. Um, when we had to change them from 50 milligrams to 18, we thought that they wouldn't work any longer, but I checked back with these people and they say it works. It doesn't work as well, but it still works yeah. fine. Works. Okay. You just could do more if it because maybe because you transition more. them yeah. and they were prepared also mentally. It depends also on their on their motivation, why they're doing this. Is yeah. it because they don't want to relapse back into smoking? So if that is the motivation, you will find many people struggling, but they will win the war eventually. I didn't actually talk about the uh, problems of nicotine salts. I've been talking just about benefits. But there are some problems associated with nicotine salts. One of the problems is that they create the galvanic currents in the pods. So uh, it may create the condition for leaking metals. In order to reduce this situation, everybody dealing with nicotine salts is very well aware of this problem and is being already solved. Uh, plating the, 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 the coils is one of the solution. It's very expensive, but it is a solution. Using platinum coils, another very expensive option. Or there are now the, in very interesting devices, um, pods, that you actually activate at the moment when you buy them. So the shelf life and the time of contact of the uh, e-liquid salt with the, uh, uh, with the coil is basically reduced uh, to a minimum, okay? There's also the issue of a number of toxicants being released by, by nicotine salts, but this pertains only to some salts, okay? Not to benzoic acids. But this is, is, is gonna be another long talk. Ricardo, yeah. can I go back to my question, please? Yeah. Um, regarding the throat hip from nicotine salts, um, and I know how important throat is, the throat hip is to get a smoker to switch, it's very, very important. I found that the nicotine salts, and my friend, my colleague John, uh, introduced me to nicotine salts, that the throat hip on the way in is nothing, but on the way out, it's a completely different story. It's a really strong throat hip throat and actually makes me cough on the exhale as opposed to the inhale, which you would expect. Is there any? So the direction you as to why this might be? Interesting. I think it has to do, there's very little studies of what gets in and what gets out from the lungs. I really think that the, most of the air being exhaled contains a lot of water because of humidification. When you humidify the exhaled breath, what happens is you change the condition of the protonation. So basically, you are creating, you are diluting down the effect of the acid. So you are going back to alkalinity. But it would be really interesting to prove my theory just by measuring alkalinity in and out of the system, which would be extremely easy. You just take a Teflon bag. These bags that are used for assessing air in environmental studies. You, you fill the bag with the, what comes out of the vaping device, and then you exhale and you make a comparison. But I'm pretty sure that's what's going to happen because the dilution is incredible. Our, our lungs, our system humidifies a big deal. So humidification will reach 98%. Okay? So it will, that, that may be one of them. So the trick there is to exhale slowly. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, yeah, I'm, I've actually experienced coffee as well, but I wouldn't say any more than when you use uh, Nick Face. I've found generally with me, it's because I'm, I'm a bit dehydrated, is generally the reason. Um, but with, back so to, drink more, not alcohol. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> and the, the interesting thing that you brought up about tanks and coils is actually um, products coming out now that actually use no coils. And they actually you use uh, ceramic plates. Yeah. So you do, you just stuff your cotton in there. You use, you're supposed to be in it. I, I really think there are a lot of combinations to play with still. Uh, and, you know, this nicotine salt world, it's, it's going to amplify our interest and our fun, uh, providing they're safe. Uh, and, I, and I believe it's, uh, they cannot be less safe of what is uh, already available now. But in, in principle, they are going to be safer because uh, uh, avoiding the... Pre I'm against the precautionary uh, principle, but in this case, I'm in for it. You know, if I, we, there are uh, quite a lot of chemicals we don't have assessed completely. There's a lot of, uh, it's called untargeted uh, chemical analysis, which means that you take this vapor and you do any analysis you want. You just don't focus on the obvious analysis, which are the analysis of the tobacco uh, of the chemicals coming out of back combustibles. So I assume that if you're not combusting, you're not gonna find any of them. And in fact, e-cigarettes, tobacco, the product that will generate less than 90% uh, of those chemicals. However, we haven't talked about untargeted analysis. And the reason why we haven't talked about untargeted analysis as yet is because electronic cigarettes are being sold as tobacco and reduction products. But the future in 20 years is going to be not tobacco and reduction. It's just going to be a completely different uh, proposition for, for, yes, I'll stop there. No, 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 I was just blowing out smoke and I was trying to... Okay. That's what's wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's completely different. Maybe we will vape for other reasons, for slimming or for getting more attention for our exams when time is due, or just for the pleasure of uh, managing stress and anxieties without the hassle of tobacco smoke. Oops. By coffee and tea. Or oh. coffee and tea. Same thing. So, tell me, is it there? Okay, I'm all studies. Uh, how much time I have? Okay, make it. There's a lot. Of, why am I talking? Why am I talking about animal studies? Uh, main reason is that most of the scary stories in the media are based on in vitro system studies and animal studies, mostly with the major methodological flaws. I'm not saying that the results are not correct, because these guys, not, they know what they're doing in terms of analysis, in terms of using the cells, in terms of sampling and measuring, using ELISAs, very complicated stuff. However, the problem is about the generation of the aerosols and exposure. Sometimes uh, the, the exposure does not reflect normal condition of use. And one important thing is that the weight of an animal is not the weight of a human being. And we really need to take this into account because if we simplify the paradigm that 600 puffs are okay for a human beings over three days, you cannot say that the same 600 pounds are okay for an for a animal that weighs 3,000 times less and it's in a cage and it's being exposed for four hours. So that's a way to maximize risk, which is obvious because scientists are after positive signals, something to measure. If you don't measure anything, it's a waste of time, waste of grants money, and waste of, uh, of resources. So you really need to go after that. But what that means in terms of application in the human or in the real world even. Okay. Let, let's take a little step, step back. Uh, we do need animals. I'm not a big favor of animals, but not very much against them. animals research. Animals research has been extremely productive and useful in the beginning of the century. 
I've been working with pharma for many, many decades, and I can tell you, in the area of respiratory medicine, animals do not help a lot. For example, there are a lot of studies showing that drug X works beautifully in animal model, but then when you run phase two, three, and four, uh, phase two or phase three trial in humans, nothing is gonna happen, okay? So what happens in animal is not 100% predictive. In, in, in men, particularly in pharmacological research. If you're talking about uh, uh, bioengineering um, stents or something like that, animals are just perfect. But for chemicals, it's a different world also because metabolism is different. And, and I accept the fact that the animals are good models because they have a whole system. It's not like cells. Cells lack of metabolism. They are just inert uh, living system. But this is more complex, and they can take into account also uh, the metabolism, which is very important for some drugs. However, uh, this is not okay for studies in relation to tobacco, let alone vape, vaping. Um, I have a few examples, recent. Uh, I think a month ago, I came across this study by um, this uh, scientist at the University of Colorado, okay? Although, except one has an English name, never mind. Um, their conclusion from this study, it was a, a study in rats, was that in these experimental models, electronic cigarettes are just as toxic as tobacco cigarettes. And the long time exposure to nicotine vapor can cause <coughs> significant lung damage, which was shown by histopathology. So they sacrificed the animal, they took the lungs, they sliced the lungs, and they subjected to histopathology. And they show quite horrific things. The horrific things are highlighted in the in this one in this in this uh, panel on the left hand side and you will see very clearly this is air this is the structure of the uh, of the lung these are the alveoli that's where the air comes in this is the structure around the alveoli where you have the exchange of air with the blood so you take air in the hemoglobin and so forth. So this is, uh, looks pretty much like a nice structure. However, when you smoke, and we know that, you eventually end up causing emphysema, okay? And this is emphysema. You have a destruction of the alveoli and uh, dysfunction will ensue from this disruption. However, the same thing seems to occur not only with vaping, yeah, but also just by injecting subcutaneously with nicotine. Yeah? No? Okay. <sighs> the problem with this kind of study, you will see, uh, and, and this is just the, the quantification, this is just a qualitative uh, image which is good for you to understand what I'm talking about. Um, first off, how long does it take to a human to develop emphysema, even if it's if it is he or she is a heavy smoker. It takes 40, 50 years. These rats have been exposed for four hours. So you can imagine that it's been a massive exposition. This is, these are rats in gas chambers, in my opinion, right? So I'm not sure how relevant that is. And you will see that uh, my position on these kind of papers is that this is a realistic exposure condition cannot inform about nicotine toxicity in humans, okay? And I wrote to the, to the editor, and actually strangely they accepted my rebuttal, uh, my critique of the paper, and I just want to go with you, don't, don't, don't be scared, I'll take you with my hand, and we'll try to keep this data, I've simplified that to the maximum, just trying to understand. Rats are very small, it's about 200 grams when they're six weeks old, right? 
and they are exposed to 600 pounds of vapor or smoke in just over four hours in cages of one cubic meter, this big, right? Actually, the generation of the vapor was not that problematic, in my opinion. So that was kind of all good. But they're still generating 600 parts over four hours in a mini cage. And humans are 400 times larger compared to, to this kind of rats. And they usually vape 600 parts in three days, not in four hours. I mean, is anybody? Vaping 600 puffs in four hours? <laughs> no, not recently. No, recently. You are an exception yeah. to my mind. Huh? Okay. Under such experimental conditions, do you think this is normal? No. Obviously not. These are massive overexposure conditions. And the animals, actually, some of them died. Do they have any oxygen in there? <laughs> <laughs> Left. <laughs> the only oxygen comes with the vape or with the smoke. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they, they, I understand the scientists that the, the, the protocol is designed to maximize harm. So it is not surprising that we see the damage that I was showing you on, on those slides. But there's more. You remember that I said nicotine was injecting subcutaneously, not by inhalation, pure nicotine. And yet, we had the same kind of damage. And the reason why is they use extremely toxic doses of, of nicotine, which surprisingly are the doses officially recommended by the guidelines. This is what surprised me. That's a, and the funny thing is that when you go and uh, check the few studies where they sacrificed the animal, instead of focusing only on the lung, they focused on the other organs, they also find terrible damage there in the liver, in the kidney, reproductive systems, and so forth. So what has smoking to do with liver? Cirrhosis from smoke? No, it's just high level concentration of chemicals will cause damage to cool in the whole body system of these poor animals. And finally, it is obvious that these data from rats are in stark contrast with what we see in normal life. <coughs> Is anybody of you having new problems since you start vaping? Actually, I had in my clinic somebody saying, Professor, since I start vaping, my sex life is back again. I had uh, erectile problems, <laughs> and uh, it was uh, anecdotal, <laughs> maybe something else, but uh, it didn't change wife in the process. So. <laughs> Uh, but I, I really think um, you're cleaning up your system, but it, it's so, so, super logic because tobacco smoke is a complex mixture, it's a complex cocktail of more than 7,000 chemicals. It's like putting in your body every day, 20 times a day, 7,000 different pills. Okay? When you switch to vaping, you still taking chemicals, but instead of taking 7,000 pills, you're taking 30, 40, or 50, and that's what makes a big difference, okay? And those pills contain less chemicals still, right? So there, there's quite a lot of evidence. We, we've been fortunate enough last year to publish a uh, four-year follow-up of vapors who never smoke in their life, so the cleanest model possible in humans. And yet, after four years of monitoring with spirometry, which is not very sensitive, to be honest, and high-resolution CT scan, we were not able to pick up in any of these individuals a single early sign of lung damage. So you tell me where we stand. Another similar study, uh, which has been uh, published uh, 
a few uh, months ago. Again, a seismic is carcinogenic to murine, lung, and bladder. Yeah. Wow, even the bladder is under attack. Okay? And it's therefore possible that electronic cigarette smoke may contribute to lung and bladder cancer. Very strong statement. And if you look at the data, I would agree with them entirely, but, and I say but twice, the problem is that when assessing health impact of electronic cigarettes, we need always to think of experimental condition that closely reflect human condition of use. Because if you don't, you are in a completely different arena. In fact, the study did not replicate any normal condition of use. They, they, they were massively overexposed, okay? There was no hint to dosimetry. They compared to tobacco, but they were not actually um, um, doing any proper dosimetry. They were massively exposed, like chronically exposed for weeks and weeks and weeks. You know what's the, li uh, the lifespan of, uh, these are mice, okay? So it's 20 gram weight animal. The, the lifespan is about, I think it's uh, less than six months, which means that you have to compare to a human beings that lives 80 years. So if you expose them for a month, it's, uh, it's actually they expose them for two months, so it's like exposing a humans for 60 years, okay? So again, these are animals exposed to toxic levels, not only nicotine, but uh, uh, a number of different chemicals that they are present. And uh, so the, uh, I'm, I'm very reluctant to consider my, uh, animal studies when it comes to vape science. And here you see listed the reason, the main reason why we have cavities with rodent studies. Uh, they're just there, you can read it for yourself. And if you want to ask questions, please do. Very social. Yeah, sometimes the strands of mice are also genetically modified to develop tumors because in a, in a sense, as you say, they want to, they want to watch tumors in action. Yeah. So mice are already modified, and then sometimes the studies don't say that. Yeah, they are, they are in a, the first study, um, criminalizing nicotine for causing lung damage was published in Thorax, which is a very respectable paper, uh, three years ago by a guy called Garcia Arcos. And in that study used a, a particular strain of mice who is susceptible to develop emphysema. So they are genetically susceptible to develop emphysema. So no big deal. Well, I mean, they were exposed to, again, overexposed to nicotine and, and vapor. And, and that's a problem. Uh, also, the, the, you need to understand that any of those studies are very product specific. You know, you are testing the product, and you cannot generalize, and they do. <coughs> they do generalize. All is in the world are causing problems. All is in the world are causing problems. I really believe there are subtle differences, and sometimes maybe not that subtle, depending on the liquids. Uh, but I'm sure that in 10 years, all this discussion will be prehistory. It will be totally uh, anecdotal, because we are moving so fast towards the direction of good quality, safety, and, and uh, that I, I'm pretty sure that these problems will be totally overcome. It was a different story with tobacco smoke when it first came out. People didn't know what was there. And, and obviously then we end up with nasty diseases that we all know. Today is different. This is not like tobacco smoke. These are tech devices. They are due to evolve. Because we study them, we find problems, and we find solutions. I remember the old discussion about how the eyes and the high temperatures, but now many of these things, uh, uh, there are two things that you need to learn. Keep your tongue very well filled, and you avoid the, the dry puff, or use temp control machines. You know, there are always solutions. 
you could not find solution then at the time of tobacco combustible which, because it was a very essential piece of um, consumer product was very difficult to modify. They tried to modify the tobacco leaves by very sophisticated engineering, and they were successful in pushing down nitrosamines, but the other chemicals were going up. So on the balance, everything was staying the same. But with tech, tech devices, the story is completely different. So if we are worried today or some risible risk, maybe this is going to completely different in five years' time, because you're not even using the same product. The, the cell cycle, the life cycle of these products is so short. I mean, after two, three, or four years, you're already on to the Sorry. next one. Sorry. I have a question. Uh, I like your uh, comparison of, uh, it's easy, easily understandable that there's 7,000 chemical components in tobacco smoke, and you compared it to taking 7,000 pills a day, and then you compared e-cigarettes 30, 40, 50, 60 pills a day. So how many pills would you assign snooze? <laughs> so, but, uh, I mean, from an inhalational point of view, I, I should say zero, because you don't inhale oral tobacco. But if you look at the uh, bloodstream, is, is that what you're uh, talking about? Snooze, I, I haven't got that much experience with snooze. But my understanding and the data I saw is that snooze is extremely safe. Extremely safe. And the biggest demonstration of all is the Scandinavian epidemiology. There's, uh, nothing, uh, there. Huh? There's just nothing there. That is, uh, yeah. Half of the prevalence of the other of the average in the in European countries in terms of lung cancer and cardiovascular disease. What else do you want? So I would say the same number of pills, just to be on the safe side. Uh, uh, <laughs> one more short question. Or maybe less. <laughs> maybe less. Are you from Sweden? Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, one more question that uh, involves uh, both e-cigarettes and snooze, of course, and other uh, products containing nicotine, is that the uh, the common knowledge that nicotine, uh, people think <coughs> nicotine is what gives you sicknesses and so on. And, and uh, I think there was a questionnaire about vaping and uh, only 10% or something. Uh, most of the, the majority thought that nicotine is, is the, the bad thing. And uh, in, in uh, FDA made a survey last year uh, asking uh, U.S. people, uh, do you believe that smokeless tobacco could be less harmful than smoking? And uh, those who answered yes were 11%. Hmm. So there's a misconception between nicotine causing harm uh, and tobacco in itself when you don't inhale it. Uh, those are not the bad guys. But why doesn't governments and tobacco control acknowledge this? Are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. If you put me in a driving seat inside the FDA, I'll be revolutionary. <laughs> but I mean, uh, you have also to to think with their to put um, to put yourself in their shoes. I think they need to be cautious and they don't really want to create. I think the main problem with the smokeless is that they may create the condition to a gateway kind of thing. It's not a purely about the toxicity that you find in blood, particularly with the pasteurized the snus product, which uh, have to follow gut attack. Uh, uh, standards which are excellent uh, standards for quality and safety. Um, but of course, not all smokeless are the same. If you go to India and you just uh, have a look at Gutka or all these things, you will realize how damaging they are, but not in terms of lung cancer, in terms of oral cancer, because the story there is different. And it's not tobacco. Only crossmine actually causing cancer there is the limestone. They mix the limestone to give a 
tangible zest on, on the floor because they love it. And when you start having a discussion about smokeless harm reduction there, they don't even understand it because they don't care. It's their karmatic way of life. They are going to die or something someday. So peace off. Let me have my gutka and, and, and this is it. So I, I see it very difficult for governments there to try to change the norm when the norm is so very much accepted, knowing that most of these products are causing such a devastating uh, problems for, for their health. However, I think my opinion is to try to implant the snooze uh, paradigm into, into India and try to adopt that at a large scale. <coughs> the only problem with snooze in India is acceptance of the consumer level. I'm not sure that people will love snooze as they love their good But that's the problem. I have a question. There are two questions. Then the snus product is rather simple. It could be engineered to taste like, act like, function like the Indian snus product. Yeah, we have but functional really, food. Why don't right. we have functional snus? Yes, exactly. And uh, we, all we need to do is just to, to try to have a, a, a panel of, of uh, aromas derived from, from the from the gutka have some kind of chemicals replicating that because uh, Let's face it, um, natural extracts are dangerous. Uh, flowering chemicals are less dangerous because the, the flowering chemicals are very well characterized. The natural extracts are basically a cocktail of different chemicals and they can interact in between themselves and you don't really know where you end up. So when it comes to standard quality and safety, there's no way you're going to introduce an extract. That was the one question. The other question, when you look at the Indian epidemiology, mm -hmm. you still arrive at the very dangerous Indian smokeless products are still about 90% safer than smoking. Mm -hmm. if you, have to, you have 206 million users of the smoking <coughs> products and we somewhere around 270,000 fatalities. Whereas you have a million fatalities from the 100 million smokers. Yeah. So, so even and, and I mean the 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 ninety percent harm reduction that we are all basically saying is fantastic in icons is pretty much the same that you have in this horrible, horrible, terrible Indian smoke. Well, the the question, the point you're raising is 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 excellent. The, and probably we need to ask the question in this way: What if all smokers would be smokers of BDs? What would be the impact on public health in that country? My opinion is that the impact would be pretty horrendous. However, we need to try for perfection in a way or not in order to engage with regulators. So we cannot just say that this is enough. It's not enough for them. Or maybe this is just an excuse. But as you said, as you said, there are ways to engineer uh, NAS functionally so that can meet the palatability of the Indian people or you know different. <coughs> I think this is a very interesting area, and you can save millions of lives, and, and and probably then you can do the same functional thing back to Europe, where people in Italy will never engage with snooze, but if you functionalize a pizza snooze, maybe they will. <laughs> I remember somebody uh, in an in a illiquid company in Italy saying, I have had a very funny request from Norway. They wanted an illiquid that tastes like an uh, anchovy. Oh. Yeah. Oh my yes. uh, like oh. fish, you know, this yeah, fish oh being salty. I said, oh my god, it's really impressive. So you can get all of these strange requests because they are culturally driven. Yes. The only problem with all that is you'll have campaign for tobacco for your kids on your back and play for Pizza play for Let's leave the kid on. Big problem. Big issues with the US. I think that these people, they don't have families, and the, the kids are out of control, and the government seems that to have to patronize them. I, I, I think this is totally absurd. I mean, they're already. Uh, 
restriction in the age of use. What, what else do you want? Okay, you're not happy with the 18 years old, put up to 21 years old. P kids will do funny things anyway. In Italy, I'll tell you this story. Mm -hmm. We are screaming out loud, ah, victory of tobacco control because uh, the number of uh, young smokers is declining. As a matter of fact, they are declining and cocaine is increasing. So, because they discovered that cocaine is more fun and more, more, uh, you know, it's, there, there's, a, there's a halo of risk around cocaine, this halo of people using it and being extremely dynamic and brilliant. So, cocaine is on, uh, on, on, on the verge. It's on the, so, I, I always try to think, of, when we focus too much trying to avoid a risk, Let's try to think 360 degrees that there are some other risks. The problem is that we've been kids, and 50% of the kids have a high risk profile in their behavior. It's a, it's a fact of life, and you have to live with it. So it's a parental responsibility whether they keep check and then control. And then you as a lawyer, you as a government, you have the responsibility to restrict sales. If you want possession, if you really, really want, two kids less than 18 years old. But uh, why being so harsh on a product that is already saving a lot of adults, that they have already issues with smoking-related disease on the go? What do you do for them? Hmm? Yep. Speak out. Like me, that this, I speak out, I don't even use the mic. Okay, the way you describe these caveats, uh, they sound like sort of no-brainer things that should be common knowledge in the scientific community. <coughs> what, uh, how is it still possible that folks that call themselves scientists still can make these grossly exaggerated conclusions based on fundamentally flawed uh, studies? <coughs> these things still get published in very many journals. How is this possible? In your uh, first of First off, you have to understand that um, scientists are a community, and uh, they tend to, to have their own gangs, tribes, and there's a tribe that believes strongly that these products are damaging. So when they see something like this, you know, something like cause damage, they are quite relaxed. They don't even look in depth into the data, and, they, and that's the way it gets published. If I send a similar paper, which is nicely crafted, crafted and nicely constructed and designed and stuff, and it goes to the same papers, I will have seven reviewers. That's what happened to me in the last paper comparing glow to ICOS and measuring uh, uh, um, biomarkers in the Excel the aircon. Seven reviewers, I've never had seven reviewers in my life, in my life, in their life, and it was a short paper because I thought, this is just a little information. It's going to be a short uh, research letter and seven reviewers. <coughs> seven. But uh, going back to your original question, I really think that we really need to start educate people. I don't think that is done. Uh, people is doing it uh, voluntarily. Uh, some people are not knowledgeable of of the products. So when I started talking about this in my meetings with the respiratory physician, I always say you have to team up with people with rating experience. They will tell you how to design better your studies because that's the way out. And yeah, you're right, it's no brain. I actually ask myself, all these studies with animals, with tobacco smoke that has been out there for decades are totally reliable or we are also talking in that case of uh, maximization of damage. Because this happens also in the epidemiology where you see big manipulation of data. Big manipulation, depending how you, you craft the, the items in your single questionnaire. And I had a meeting today with the epidemiological expert and, and they all feel that it's time to reconvene and to redesign the questionnaires for uh, sketching the epidemiology of, uh, of tobacco-related consumption, uh, tobacco consumption in different countries. Because things are getting out of hand. You know, there, there's very little granularity in what they are capturing. 
And if you don't have the granularity of the information, for example, dual usage. Dual uses dual usage is being used as a big scary thing. However, I can tell you if you reduce the tobacco consumption eighty to eighty five at more than fifty percent, you will do see improvement in health outcomes. So to, so it's not to say that if you reduce ten, twenty percent you're gonna get any benefit. Of course not. You're gonna compensate. But if you are and heavy reducer, I mean, I cannot see why heavy reducer are going to be uh, characterized in the same basket with just little reducers or light reducers. It's not actually the same thing. Also, somebody who makes this big effort to reduce uh, uh, their number of cigarettes per day consumed from baseline by 80 or 90 percent, they are very much likely to quit altogether if you give time. Sooner or later, though, they will leave it. So you, you see how many problems we have to deal at the same time, how many uh, complexities uh, are there. Uh, we t epidemiologists, I think, they tend to simplify things. They have their own models, they have their own questionnaires. When they start the past study, they basically started using the questionnaires that are being used for tobacco consumption. doesn't make any sense. You need to know the vaping lifestyle to design and craft a proper questionnaire. Juuling. You don't really know how much juuling is out there. How do you define juuling? Do you, are they consuming one pod a day, two pods a day, one pod a month? Yeah, because they can use one pod a month. And they just puff it three or four times at the party during the weekend, and then they will repeat the same, the same uh, behavior on the following weekend. So this level of information is not there, and people, depending whether you are a vaping advocate or depending whether you are an anti-vaping advocate, you play with the information and you mold it the way you want it. So that's the reason why there's so much disagreement. Because everybody's playing and molding. We are all uh, craftsmanships. Yeah. There's, there's no business like show business. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think it's, just um, thinking about it. some parts of it are uh, understandable. That's why some specific misunderstanding about the paper products. Well, it's unfor unforgivable at the same time we're doing it responsible um, situation you know, being a scientist in the scientific community because even as a smoker um, you still have to research we have to really have to research vaping in order to be able to make the switch but because we had to so anyone who's not linked that closely to what to do that doesn't need to do that so they're going to be dis you know they're going to be more distant from um, dealing with that situation. So I think that's why you're getting, you know, misguided results, partly. Entirely good. Um, I, I think yeah. I wanted to say something. All right. Now, we were talking about children before, and uh, as you explained it very well, the uh, rat study compared to humans. But in Sweden, some months ago, there was on TV something that scared the shit out of every pregnant woman in Sweden who have used snooze because they said the ri the increased risk for sudden uh, uh, sudden baby, baby death yeah. or, or what you call it sudden infant death was increased a lot if you use snooze mm -hmm. so I checked it out there were 23 deaths in uh, 145,000 pregnant women, uh, babies, and then... You so that's a chance finding, because that's exactly what happens even say, if you don't... Yeah. They, say it, they say A, but they don't say B. Increased risk, 23 deaths per year, and that is not including smoking, drinking, uh, obsessity, or what, whatever. And then I looked at Sweden in the world. We had the fifth lowest infant death in the world. And still we have uh, 
the scare. So a the quarter scare of a million uh, snoozing women. I think one of the problems with the, the news media is the they really want to hype bad stories. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what sells newspapers. Unfortunately, sensationalistic uh, news is uh, is uh, is due <coughs> to sell newspapers. But uh, there are a few good ones that try to anchor the, and frame the, uh, re and this data into the reality. I think this is always very important. It's just exactly what you said. When you refer to the EU leverage, we are still one fifth below. You know, why didn't say that? So that's, a, that's, that's extremely. Um, it's the way you play the game, in, in a way. Maybe we should um, stop playing. There again, yeah. <laughs> with the facts. I, I, I still believe that we need to be uh, noble in what we do and try to be, to be drawn in their game because this, uh, I mean, how would you feel like? This is something that, uh, that uh, I don't really know about their conscious. Some, some of them are really lying. They really know that they are uh, on, on the... I, I meant methods, not, uh, uh, of course, we stick to the truth, or the facts, or the science. But you see, even methods can be fallacious, <coughs> because they can be manipulated in a way, they can generate uh, data in a way or the other. The typical example is um, the power wattage in, in, uh, in the e-cigarettes. Uh, if you play with the wattage and you drive to the level of dry puffs, you're gonna get lots of the It's even more than in, in normal cigarettes. If you if you instead tune, finely tune the level of wattage so that you do not create condition for dry puffs, you will never see that high levels. Yeah, but sorry, I forgot. What's your personal point of view in the future for the next 10 years regarding the uh, science point of view uh, to influence the decision makers. What do you think? Uh, I, I have a little recipe myself. The, the recipe is as follows. <clears throat> we really need to have more people collaborating together on projects. When you collaborate on projects, um, what happens is that you get involved, you get in love with the project, and uh, this is a, uh, is a good way to to get um, to get interested in into the topic and maybe to get the topic right. When I first started, I remember on e cigarettes, I was very, I was very skeptical. I just said, "This is not going to work. This is a joke." However, maybe I'm a clinician and things are slightly different. I had so many people coming back at me, hugging, because they say, "Oh, quit smoking, thank you, your gadget." Um, you know, never happened to me before that after giving champics or, or patches, somebody was, they were grateful, but nobody was actually behaving in that way. It was such, a, such an exhilarating moment. It was such a, a motivational uh, moment. You know, working in a smoking cessation clinic is a hard job and frustrating at times. Uh, you have to consider our quit rate in the smoking cessation program is very high, it's about 50%. It means one out of two will quit for at least one year. Okay? But you know, other people working on their clinics and not having organized ways of, uh, of planning uh, smoking cessation programs, they have a success of one in 10 or two in 10. That means if the first eight are failures, you feel pretty much shit about the job you're doing, and yeah. you question yourself about the effort and amount of time you're putting there. And all the <coughs> crazy ones reaching the subject number nine where they have a little success, they will uh, keep on believing it. But most of cardiologists, of pneumologists, respiratory physicians are so busy with other stuff that for them, a 20% success rate is unacceptable. It is acceptable only for epidemiologists, <coughs> to, to, to the best of my knowledge. And so some uh, psychologists, they, they are, they, they just do the, this job and that job only. I'd like to, everybody, um, we've run over, but that's okay. Um, we should.
Thank you very much, Dr. Pelosa. Thank I think we should give him a round of applause. And very you thank you yourself. for having me today. And uh, I really hope if you have any burning questions, don't hesitate to contact me.